Well, the Nuggets, as predicted, moved on. Now I have them going to the finals. Now that was when the playoffs started, but I'm not going to change my mind. I got Nuggets. I had Bucks. Bucks are out. I got Nuggets. I had Celtics. Of course, they lost last night too. Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports NBA. The NBA bubble playoffs continue. Let's start with, I don't know. Let's go Celtics heat with uh, Keith Smith. Start it off. We'll flip over to the Western side next because I want to get Keith's opinion on this. What was going on with the Celtics offense in the last eight minutes of that game last night? I don't know. If you can figure it out, you know, call Brad Stevens and let him know because I think he's trying to figure it out too. I, it, It's a problem. Now, this is several games in this playoff where late in the game they have gone way too ISO heavy. They're getting into stuff really, really late. And I think Brad Stevens is today, yesterday after the game and today with kind of a night's sleep and, and looking at it again, he was as outwardly frustrated as he's ever going to get, which is not, not very much so. But when you see him all the time, you kind of get a sense. And, and one of the things he said was, we're not running our stuff. And that tells me that he's got play calls that are coming in and the guys are maybe just going away from them. Uh, late in games. And and he credited Miami for their switching and their defense and all those things. But then he, you know, repeated once again, you just can't over dribble. You can't pound the air out of the ball for, you know, 18, 20 seconds of a possession and then hope to get a good shot. So I think you're going to see Boston, if it's a close game, I think you're going to see them move the ball uh, quite a bit more here down the stretch in game two. What uh, What's the impact of not having Hayward, do you think, it, it, to these woes that they're having with the, the offensive look? Yeah, it's pretty huge. Gordon Hayward is their best playmaker. He's their best ball mover in the starting five. And now that doesn't mean he's the best scorer, but he's probably the third or fourth best scorer on the team. He is their best passer. So what you lose with Hayward is when he gets the ball, you know something good's almost always going to come out of it. He's either going to get a good shot himself or he's going to set up the teammate or he's going to make the pass that leads to the pass that gets things moving, especially against zone defenses. He's the Celtics' best player. Miami played a ton of zone in game one. Hayward is Boston's best guy who can drive the gap get into the middle either for shots himself or get the ball moving, get it reversed, and get those open looks. So so they're really missing him. They upgraded him just a little bit ago to doubtful for game two. So, you know, I wouldn't count on him playing, but clearly he's getting closer. And I, I think you're going to see him game three, maybe game four at the very latest in this series. What are your thoughts on Kemba Walker? It's pretty highlighted that this is the best he's done so far in terms of getting deep into the postseason. Took a lot of shots to get his 19 points. We we understand his size when it comes to playing the point guard position. He's obviously a smaller guard. What were your thoughts on yesterday's performance and you know what he has been throughout the playoffs to this point? Yeah, yesterday he was just missing shots. He he got a lot of good, clean, open looks and just couldn't get him to go down. Um, he says that the knee's not bothering him. Brad Stevens says the knee isn't bothering him. Talk to anybody else with the team. They say he looks healthy. The one thing that it does seem a little noticeable, he doesn't really have great bursts. Um, he's not able to get guy, by guys off the bounce, which we saw even in the first round. He was getting by some of Philadelphia's guards and getting into to the paint for either little pull-ups or for layups and those kind of things. He had a little bit of trouble with that against Toronto, but you kind of wrote that off because Toronto geared their whole defense in games five through seven towards taking away Kemba Walker. That was the guy they felt that they needed to stop. And then the Heat did not do that, so he got more open looks. He just couldn't knock him down. So I'm tending to believe he's just in a really really bad slump and you know that you know I, I, I always believe you know averages you know things get back to their averages water finds its level however you want to put it and I think you're going to see Kemba Walker have a breakout game here fairly soon where he might go for 40 45 points and kind of carry Boston to a win but you know that's just you know maybe being a little optimistic and hopeful. Uh, Keith Smith you know when you look at obviously the Heat won the game what do the Heat do? And now it's a great game. They go to overtime. But what is it about the Heat um, that maybe would worry you moving forward if you're a Boston fan out there? Uh, they're shooting on offense. It's tough to guard all of their shooters. They've just got a lot of guys who can knock down 
jump shots on the flip side. I don't think Jay Crowder is going to continue to shoot 100%, um, which is what it feels like he shot for the entirety of this playoff run so far. So we'll, we'll see, you know, if he eventually cools off, um, you know, there. But, but, you know, Duncan Robinson didn't have much of an impact, so maybe he picks up the pace there a little bit. So that's, that's worrisome. They, they go about seven, eight, nine guys deep, which are all good quality players who know their role. And that makes it tough, too, because because that's just depth Boston can't match, especially without Gordon Hayward. And then defensively, they've got a lot of guys who are really long. They're not overly quick, uh, their they're defensive guys, but Jay Crowder, Jimmy Butler, Andre Iguodala, Derek Jones Jr., those guys all have great length. And then behind them, you have Bam Adebayo backing them up. So if anybody does get through, he, he's there to kind of try to clean things up and erase things at the basket area. So they're just really tough to get, you know, scores on. So I think you, you saw the Celtics go to a lot of mismatch hunting. They tried to get at Duncan Robinson when he was in the game, tried to go with some at Goran Dragic and some at uh, Tyler Hero. And I would expect Boston to amp that up just a little bit. Gil and I were going back and forth about this earlier in the show and asked a couple of our guests, what would have been a cooler moment? a huge dunk on Bam or the block because the block was so impressive as well. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say maybe the block because the block won the game um, where the dunk it would have tied it. If it was a one point game, I think the dunk would have been, you know, amazing because then it would have been, been a game winner. But since, since all, all that would have done is tie it, I'll go with the block because that block was, I had been, you know, asked a million times since last night. And, and I've got a, you know, third in the best blocks I've ever seen. And that's behind LeBron's block in, in the NBA Finals. Uh, as Cleveland was coming back in that game seven. And then uh, Tayshaun Prince has chased down a Reggie Miller um, in that Eastern Conference Finals, just because those were a little bit bigger stakes than a game one uh, of a playoffs. But, but that Bam out of Iowa block, that was just something special. Let's uh, go over to the West with Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports NBA. The Nuggets win. They're down 3-1. They do it for the second straight series. But really, I mean, they seem to, especially in the second half of that game, just be toying with the Clippers. The Clippers just seemed like tired, almost disinterested, and just couldn't figure out what to do with the, with Jokic. Yeah, by the time there were seven, eight minutes left in the fourth quarter, they it was all nuggets. They, it was over. They, they really turned it into a rout. And the Clippers, you know, they played it out from there and were never really close again. And then Jokic, was, that was as dominating a performance from without having a great scoring game as you're probably ever going to see. He just controlled everything. His chemistry with Jamal Murray in the two-man game is so off the charts right now. He's going to get Murray a good look, and if they overplay on Murray, Jokic is going to score himself or he's going to find somebody else. And that's, you know, that makes them really, really tough to defend. I think the Lakers should be favored, and I know they are favored, and they should be. And, and it's, But they're going to have their hands full regarding those two guys because those are two guys – that can give them a little bit of trouble and they can't really match the production. It's going to be the rest of the Lakers against the rest of the Nuggets is probably where you give a little bit of an advantage to LA because LeBron James and Anthony Davis are so good. What happened to Paul George? It's almost as if the moment is too big for him and it just blows my mind to think that that's reality. He was shooting from the corner and it was hitting the side of the backboard. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. Yeah, I haven't picked up a ball in months, and I imagine that's how I would shoot at this point. And, you know, so looking at, I, I'm not sure. I just, it, it's really sad because this is several times now Paul George has really not come through in a game seven. He, his game seven record is pretty poor, and he has really struggled in, in those scenarios, or his elimination game record, maybe it is, but, but he has just really had a rough time of it. And, it. and it's tough because this is a guy who, for periods of the regular season, looks like an MVP candidate and then you know certainly an all nba type player and then as you get deeper into the playoffs he just struggles so i'm not i'm not entirely sure what the reasoning is i will tell you there were various points down the stretch is that lead got away from the clippers and it really started to turn to the nuggets where i looked on the floor and i saw clippers players that looked like they didn't want to touch the ball they were playing hot potato with it 
there was twice Doc Rivers called sets and Clippers players waved off, you know, hey, I don't want to be involved in the play, run it to the other side, which messed everything up because you had, you know, three guys, four guys running one play and one guy was doing his own thing. And it was just, it was just a mess. So I'm not entirely sure, you know, what was going on with that team. I know they had all sorts of reasoning and excuses afterwards, some of which are valid, some of which I don't really buy so much, but it just, they, they talk about letting go of the rope. They didn't only let go of the rope. They let go of it, and they threw that thing off the cliff side. All right, uh, that'll be uh, Lakers and Nuggets. We'll have the game for you Friday on 97.3 ESPN, game one. Keith, I want to get some thoughts on you on this Sixers job opening here because Mike D'Antoni's name is being mentioned as maybe the favorite. you got Ben Simmons, who hasn't shot a three in about five years, and Joel Embiid as your two best players. Mike D'Antoni's team shoot about 53s a game. Does he fit with this roster? I can't think of maybe a worse fit. That is uh, uh, jamming a square peg into a, a round hole to the nth degree. And that's a, you know, a, a round hole that's the size of about a dime and a square peg that's the size of about a city block. It just, it's, it's not, that will not work without major changes to the roster. Now they have pieces that I think could really excel um, with Mike D'Antoni. I think you would see Al Horford have a rebirth. I think you would see Tobias Harris and Josh Richardson put together some of the best numbers of their career, but those are, you know, not the important players on Philly's roster. The important guys are Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, and neither one of them really fits. We saw D'Antoni when he had Shaquille O'Neal. It did not go well in that that was really kind of the end in the undoing of his time with the Phoenix Suns. And then you mentioned it, Ben Simmons isn't a shooter, and there's no room for a non-shooter in a Mike D'Antoni grouping. That was part of the reason why they got rid of Clint Capella was because let's lean fully into this thing. So I just said that is not the move I would make. I would look somewhere else, you know, versus going that direction just because that fit just seems so messy unless you're committed to making a major roster overhaul. Since we're on the topic of coaches, do you think Doc Rivers stays in L.A.? Yeah, it sounds like they're not going to fire him, and he's not. He's certainly not going to quit. I, I think what you're looking at there, if you're the Clippers, is you're hoping this. You, you're you're probably writing it off to this was a weird year. We did not have the time to build the chemistry. They made a bunch of changes around the trade deadline because of their aggressive load management um, policies with Kawhi Leonard, as well as the injuries that they had. They never had their guys together until that first round playoff series against Dallas and they struggled at times against the Mavericks and they clearly struggled and couldn't close out the Denver Nuggets. So I think you're looking at it as saying, all right, we had a weird year. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George came here to play for Doc Rivers. If you get rid of Doc Rivers, now you're looking at a scenario where uh, Leonard and George are going to, play out this next season, then they're both going to opt out of their contracts. If you remember, Kawhi only signed a three-year deal because he wanted to time, time it up to be a free agent at the same time as Paul George. So this was really turned into about a two-year look because that last year is a player option for each of them. And if Doc's not there, the guy that they went there to play for, that starts to get real, real messy. You better than be winning a championship or really in contention if you're going to hope to keep those two guys around in Clipper uniforms. All right, so what about Billy Donovan? That was a little bit of a nah, sorry, say a huge surprise, but you know they they part ways out there. His name immediately came up uh, when that happened with the Sixers. So uh, and apparently he's going to come in and interview. D'Antoni is going to be here interview, and we know Lou has name has come up. Uh, so what about Billy Donovan? Yeah, I think he'd be a great coach for Philadelphia. I, I think he'd do a really good job. I, I think in a lot of ways they have better pieces than what Oklahoma City had. Um, that Donovan had really good success with. He He's done it with a non-great uh, shooting primary ball handler in Russell Westbrook before. I think he could, could pull that off with Ben Simmons. Uh, Joel Embiid is a much better version of Steven Adams. He's also had a lot of success as other teams went small with playing two bigs at times. So he might be able to figure out something that works with Simmons and Horford together. So I think that's big. I think you plug Tobias Harris in the Danilo Gallinari scoring role. So I think there's a lot of things Billy Donovan would do well there. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, then why did he you know, get fired? Well, he didn't get fired. He just, his contract was up and he did not want to be a part of a rebuild. And all the signs that are, are coming out of Oklahoma City is they're going to tear it down and they're going to lean heavy into this rebuild. And all these future picks they have coming from the Clippers and the Rockets, as well as some of their own young players, that's going to be the direction they 
they go. And Donovan, I think, is smart enough to know once you've been the coach when the team was on top, you're not going to survive the teardown to, to get back on top again. And I think that's why he left. It was nothing about his coaching ability because the Thunder wanted to keep him for at least two, three more years. Right. So a lot of Sixer fans are not excited about Ty Lu. It Would he be a good fit, and why would people not be excited about him? Um, I think the reason people aren't excited about him is there's a belief of, well, he's just LeBron's guy. He can only win if it's with with LeBron. There, There's a belief of, from some that he won with David Blatt's team, that, that he, he didn't do anything um, different. He just ran the stuff David Blatt had installed. He just had the respect of the players. But I'll say it's that last part why you should be excited. He is a very, very well-respected guy. He is somebody that the players really – like they enjoy um whenever you know you get kind of the lebron stamp of approval that goes a long way in the nba and a lot of other veterans have also come out and said you know how much they like tyloo how much they respect him and he's a guy who he, he had pretty good rapport with kyrie irving once upon a time as well so that that's also you know a benefit because he's a tough guy to coach a tough guy to reach so so i think think you're looking at this is a guy who can come in and maybe some of the personalities help handle them somewhat for philadelphia because he's not necessarily a player's coach in the sense of you know just kind of do whatever you want to do he's more of a you know a respected players type coach where he'll put you in your place if you need to be all right so if Keith Smith was running the Sixers, is there one of those guys or somebody available that intrigues you to replace Brett Brown? You know, it's interesting. The first thing I would have done, I know he already said no, but I would go back and ask Jay Wright, what is your number? And, and, and find, find out what that number is. Just find, find out how ridiculous it is. Because we all know there is a number where he will leave Villanova. Um, and then, then I would, you know, look at, at the ownership group and say, are we willing to, to pay that. I just, I think he makes the most sense because he instantly comes in with, with he's beloved in the city. He's somebody who has a lot of respect in the city. And I, and I think, you know, that's the direction that you could go that would get people fired up and excited. But beyond that, if he's not going to go, I think I'm leaning towards, I would go with Billy Donovan. I think he's the guy who maybe makes the most sense. And then you can, you know, get, keep things moving forward in Philadelphia because that team is not, they're not in the position where it's, all right, let's tear this thing down. Let's bottom back out. Let's rebuild it. They're, they're not there. They're still a good team. They now need a coach who can come in with a fresh set of ideas, look at things a little bit of a different way. And, again, I think that roster, the way it's built, is set up for a team that Donovan's had success with before and could maybe replicate a little bit of that in Philadelphia. All right, there you go. Keith Smith, of course, uh, Yahoo Sports NBA. The NBA playoffs continue on 97.3 ESPN. We'll keep our eye on what the Sixers end up doing. Uh, with that search, it looks like Mike D'Antoni is going to interview this week, as will Billy Donovan. Uh, we know Jason Kidd said he's interested in the job. Don't know how that would go. Uh, but there are some interesting names. Doesn't seem that anybody, though, is a clear favorite for at least the fans out there. But we'll see if anything changes. And, of course, Keith Smith, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Keith, thanks so much, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Y'all stay safe. You and yours.